It's one thing to listen to doom and gloom about food and fertilizer shortages, skyrocketing prices, the cost of living, or your job being outsourced overseas or eliminated due to automation. It's quite another thing to hear practical, immediately actionable advice from experts who can help you reduce the fear, anxiety, and burden of these problems. Tune in now to the Surviving Hard Times podcast from the Finding Genius Foundation with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Surviving Hard Times podcast, sponsored by the Finding Genius Foundation. Uh, today, I have Joseph Lynch. He's the owner and CEO of Survival Living, LLC. We're going to talk about issues related to uh, preparing you know, to push back against recession and higher ga- gas prices and possible food shortages and all these uh, these terrible things that hopefully uh, are not on the horizon, but it looks like they are. So, Joseph, thanks for coming. I appreciate you having me here. Yeah, if you would, tell me a bit about your background. How did you become aware or care about uh, preparing for, you know, uh, bad times? Uh, I guess it pretty much goes back to growing up in the mountains up there in North Carolina. A lot of us were not. Very wealthy. We lived uh, in the poverty level. We had ice storms every year. So it, it became a certain aspect of prepping was pretty much a normal, normal way of life back then. You know, you had to be prepared for the snowstorms and things like that. But the major events started waking me up when everybody laughs, but Y2K, you know, that's when it kind of dawned on me that, hey, if something major was to happen, most people are not prepared for a long event. I mean, we weren't. Um, but I didn't really get started into serious prepping until the whole um, 2001 thing, phenomenon that came around with the uh, was the Aztec calendar and stuff like that. Now, I didn't think the world was going to end, but I started really looking at what was going on in the world during that time. And I'm like, yeah, I need to really focus on being prepared. And this actually saved my rear end many times as far as job loss, house being burnt down, things like that. You know, so 2012, my I have dyslexia. Numbers are backwards sometimes. The 2012. And that's when I really focused hard on actually prepping and learning how to actually secure in food for long-term vacuum sealing, rotational stock, water purification. And that's just a prepping aspect. I mean, I started outdoor survival back when I was a kid. Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, and progressed from that, taking survival courses across North America, and then eventually started my own business teaching basic survival seems like even to me, you know, the past 10 years, things have really, the uncertainty has really accelerated. You know, we all dealt with, uh, you know, the whole virus situation in the past two years. I don't know, has your perspective, has your resolve hardened? Like, do you, do you feel like we're, we've moved closer to systemic bad things happening or like, how do you feel the, the U.S. is right now? What position is it in and where is it at? Oh yeah, I'm definitely, uh, my resolve is definitely hardened even more on that, especially the last 10 years, but the, the shutdowns and stuff from the virus was all preppers. We, we get slapped with a tenfold hat, crazy scenario. That's what everyone always calls us because we're preparing. It was a justification on our end because we, we were prepared for, for lockdowns, shutdowns. Everyone says it will never happen in America. People don't realize that all the executive orders and things like that that have been signed, they can shut down anything they want. All they have to do is declare a natural disaster or a national emergency, and they can make you stay in your home. Yes, that's what they did. 
yep, in the pandemic, you weren't going out. And even if you were going out, too bad, they shut down everything. Well, the large majority of things, they shut down. Um, so, yeah, having stocks on hand is is always, always key. You know, I, I tell people, if something was to happen, you look at um, the barges, the barge situation where cargo containers were coming into the United States, and all of a sudden we had a huge bottleneck on every coast, and plus the Gulf, everything could not get in. We started seeing prices change then. Our delivery system is is a spider web. It is. Everything's connected, but if you break one strand, it puts a strain on the whole system. And it doesn't take much to do it, whether it be conflict or a pandemic, anything can actually make everything stop. So this is why we always push on the prepping aspect of things, having things in your home, no matter what, you have the way to feed your family. And again, case in point was the pandemic. Everything was shut down. They, they made everything shut down. You look at fuel prices right now. Um, the wages have not changed. And even if the wages do change, it's just going to make everything else go up. A lot of people are advocates for higher wages, but the fact is it's not going to fix anything. You give everybody higher wages, the products are all going to go up again, and everybody's still in the same economic bracket they were in before, but now paying $9 for a loaf of bread. Sure, you're making 15 but it still didn't change anything. All it did actually, was- actually, you know what? From what I've read recently, it, it, you know, it can put part of your income into a higher tax bracket. So you actually will probably go backwards in terms of your ability to buy the higher your wages. If they Prices don't change the tax brackets, yeah, absolutely. You're correct on that. If they don't change the tax brackets, I think what it will be when they, when they actually successfully do this, and I believe they will, um, eventually they're going to see, I think, uh, I don't think anything's by chance. I never do. There's a reason why we have politicians and governments and stuff. They got, think tanks and everything else. All we can do is look at it and try to figure out what they're doing. They're going to go for a universal payment, a monthly universal payment. In my belief, everybody's going to be making the same wages. It doesn't matter what your job is. And then they know, except the, the elites, what I call the elites, the super rich, they will always have their step up above everybody else. All the rest of us, we're going to be dropped down into a bracket. We're going to be working for a certain wage. doesn't matter your job. And that universal payment they've been pushing for the last couple of years. We've seen it pop up a lot more in uh, Canada and other countries. They've been trying to push this. And most of it is from a socialist aspect. And I'm afraid that's going to get pushed here in America. And I think it will take hold. So what are some um, practical tips you have for people? Like what, what do you think some of the first problems people are going to face is, I mean, right now already gas has gone a lot higher. So surrounding gas and transport, do you have any tips for people on how they could get more out of the gas in their car somehow? Or, you know, how can they adjust to accommodate higher gas prices? As far as uh, adjusting vehicles and stuff like that, we don't have vehicles running on carburetors anymore. Everything's fuel injected. And uh, yeah, they are more fuel efficiency. Um, definitely carpooling with people if you're planning out your trips, for one. Right off the bat, plan out your trips. You need you need to plan out if you're going to the grocery store, you know, you go, I see it all the time. People go to the grocery store like every three days. And I actually know people that go every day because they want to go to the fresh produce aisle, but they have this thing where they won't put anything in the refrigerator. It's got to be fresh sitting on the counter every single day. Cut that out. If you go into the store, make it once a week. Or if you're able to stock up a lot and you're able to pick the things you need, Start making a grocery run every two weeks, and but make sure you buy everything you need during that time. Does it take work? Yes, it does. You have to sit down, plan out what you need, make meal plans, everything else. I'm not saying you should only just hide in your home, but with the fuel prices the way they are, and in my belief, they're going to go up even higher, um, and there's also going to be shortages. I've got people in my community that are contacting me where they go to fill up their vehicle. I believe, I believe the last one was in Pennsylvania. They have a cutoff, $80 doesn't matter how many gallons you got in there, 80 bucks was the max you can put in your vehicle. Well, like my vehicle, I drive a big old Tahoe, 80 bucks is not filling it up. So hmm. we're going to see this. You need to, you need to, my advice is to plan out your trips as much as possible. Make a, make a grocery run at two weeks, you know, start out a week so you can get used to it. Carpool if you're going to work with other employees and stuff like that. You actually will be saving a lot of gas, especially where everybody puts in a fund for the, for the fuel. So instead of four vehicles going, you got one. I'm not all about the, you know, Green New Deal or anything like that. I'm just trying to make sure you can save you some money on gas because it's going to go crazy. Of course, running an air conditioned unit, yeah, that does burn more fuel. 
I've seen people say we should all go to electric vehicles. Unfortunately, our grid is not designed to have everybody with electric vehicles. There's not enough power that's actually produced. And another thing people don't look at is that the amount of coal that is needed to be burned and other ways of generating power to run these systems burns more fuel, fossil fuels, than having regular gasoline engines because you have to completely redo the whole the whole structure. Everything has to be redone. The only way it's going to happen is every everybody has uh, nuclear power plants in their cities to run this this power grid that's going to be needed for all of these electric cars. So it's a feasible aspect in the future. It's not feasible right now. We don't have the grid set up or the delivery of power for everyone to have electric yeah. vehicles. Well, also the infrastructure. You know, if you have an electric car, there's a, a couple places maybe to charge it up. But how long does it take compared to pumping gas? And there just doesn't seem to be any infrastructure, even if you had an electric car. Like besides charging it at home, what if you need to charge it when you're out? What do you do? That's true. Uh, my brother and I, we were... We went and hit a uh, Walmart run late last night, well before the close, because now they're not open 24 hours anymore. We we're coming back, and we're, we're taking a look at the gas stations in our area. Not a single electric vehicle plug-in. We're down here in Florida, and I know that some of the major cities have these things, but if you're in tourist areas and stuff like that and other places, there's no place to plug in. How many times have you had to stop at a gas station that you didn't ever know about, but you needed gas right then? What happens if you're in an electric vehicle? Most people in the reports I see, they're having to call a company to come bring a portable power station to them, which is a diesel engine, and also the generator that produces the power to charge up the car uses diesel. So right now, the infrastructure is not set up for that thing at all. Yeah. Have you ever seen a side-by-side comparison of an electric car versus a gas car? All the things that go into making it, running it, all the outputs... Uh, an honest comparison. Does it exist? No, I haven't ever seen one of those. I have seen some uh, reports on the manufacturing of the batteries, a single battery for that system and the amount of pollution that is required for the recycling and also manufacturing of that is a lot worse than running a gasoline engine. So there's a lot of things that are hidden underneath what, you know, to be green. And if you really look into the manufacturing production of the item itself, it's not green at all. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. I've asked many people that, and I've heard a lot of people say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that exists. So I said, oh, great, could you send it to me? And then they yeah. can't find it. Yeah, I haven't seen a side-by-side comparison, but I've done a lot of research in the battery manufacturing. And because they're using the mining process alone to separate the metals that they need for that battery is very polluting. So, I mean, I, I get the idea sounds nice and green until you actually research the battery material and you're like, no, it's not. This thing is very toxic. It takes forever to recycle compared to even a plastic bag. Everyone's all about plastic bags. Yeah, plastic bags are bad for the environment, sure. But that lithium battery that is dropped in the ground because they can't get rid of it, it's going to be a thousand times worse. So what, um, I don't know, anything else people can do in terms of gas? Like, is there any point in storing gas in a can or multiple cans of their house or is that dangerous or you know the having extra um, what about that yeah so what we do we store fuel uh we have a four month supply of fuel on hand and now everybody needs to make sure they check their local zoning laws because the last thing you want right now is a fine or possibly incarceration time in the county lockup because you broke some safety violation so make sure you check your county laws because some places will not let you store fuel but if you can, and if, if you'll find out if you can, how much you can actually have too, because some places you have to have license because you're considered a uh, business dealer and type of stuff like that. Best thing to do, keep it small. We keep four months supply. Now, what we do, we fill up these four months supply. We add fuel additives. This is a stabilizer. Now, you'll hear all kind of arguments about how long gasoline will last. I go by the manufacturer recommendation, which is eight months to a year with a fuel stabilizer, all right? So what we do, we fill those up. When our vehicle needs fuel, we cycle through. We grab one of our five-gallon jugs, put it in the vehicle, fill it up until it's topped off. And we do this every time we drop a quarter of a tank, which is five gallons. And then we take that five-gallon, empty five-gallon, we go fill it up, and we rotate it to the back of our stocks. That way, our fuel is always fresh. It will never get close to a six-month time. Is it a lot of work? It is. It's a lot of work being a prepper and having a rotational stock, but your stocks will last you much longer because when things go down, 
having four months supply of fuel or however much you have one you can run your vehicle two you can run a gasoline engine as far as a generator and during a power out if you have fuel stocked up so yeah i do support stocking fuel but again check your local areas on your zoning laws because you can get hemmed up and you don't want that to happen you know during this time no that's a good idea and then in terms of having extra of either food or other supplies or gas how much extra should someone have where it's not overkill but it's practical are there different levels of that okay so when you first start prepping as far as food my recommendation is go with normal foods you normally eat this is canned goods and dry goods canned goods go from green beans corns potatoes carrots yada yada and meats all right and then um your dry goods your beans pastas uh, like spaghetti noodles, elbow noodles, macaronis, things of that nature, flour, sugar, salt, your basic stuff that you can make your own meals. Okay. So one of the biggest thing I tell people, you need to learn how to start cooking because that's going to be key. You're going to be cooking your own food. Now, the argument I get with people is that I don't have enough money to start prepping. If you have $5 extra, when you go to the grocery store, buy an extra of something and put it back. Now, canned goods will last a long time. There's an expiration date and then there's a best buy date due to being a, what's the correct word? Liable for wrong information. I have to say, follow the dates. As a prepper though, storage lasts much longer. And it's, the reason it does is because of how you store it. Make sure you store it in a climate controlled room. There's been many studies that these canned goods and dry goods have lasted so much longer. And I believe they do. I have done it, but I can't tell people to do it because one case of botulism from somebody and then, you know, we'll have that issue. Uh, but can goods oh, and dry goods. But can you talk about, you know, how pe people would typically store it and what's alternative ways of storing it that, you know, may extend the life again with no guarantees? And could you say okay. with caveats, for instance? So with the canned goods and dry goods. Um, you can get stock them up and make sure they're vertical. You know, you got up top and bottom, make sure you stock them just like that. Don't, don't lay them on their side. Uh, stock those just like that. Keep them in a climate control room. If you have air conditioning in your house, things like that, make sure that you keep the temperature, your regular room temperature. You don't want it bouncing up and down. Don't put this stuff in an outside building that the, that the uh, temperature fluctuate because it will kill the life of that can. When you deal with uh, dry goods, Vacuum sealing or mylar with oxygen absorbers will extend the life of pastas, rice, beans, all these things for many, many years. I'm talking anywhere from seven to over 20 years on your dry goods, as long as it's vacuum sealed, oxygen absorber, or mylar. They last, they last a very long time. This here also needs to be put in climate control room. Any type of food you don't want to have fluctuating temperatures. One of the biggest things I've seen people do wrong, they put it in an attic space, like a crawl space, so it's out of the way. Because when you start accumulating a lot of food, it does get in the way. Um, that is the worst thing right there. And same with a garage that fluctuate in temperature during the wintertime, the concrete gets cold. Those, those, that food is going to change temperature. Anytime that happens, you're cutting the life of that food. So that's the best way. I teach that a lot on my channel, showing vacuum sealing, mylar, stuff like that, and how to seal up certain types of food. But that's the best way with dry goods and things. Okay. So there's ways to store them to potentially extend the life quite a bit more. But so when someone wants to again begin preparing, so what I've heard from some people is, you know, well, look, if things get bad enough, it's not going to matter anyway. There'll be chaos out in the streets. What do you say to that? Um, should people prepare again for you know, a, a short-term blackout or loss of power or a short-term food shortage, or do they really need to prepare for a long one? Yes and yes <laughs> on all of it. Uh, we prepare for everything as much as possible. Most scenarios, fortunately for us, all goes back into the exact same prep. So if you're prepping for one scenario, blackout for a few days, which means your stores and stuff won't be running or you know, they might be running on, on generators, stuff like that, but which are supply, uh, store up as much as we can. What I recommend everybody doing is to do your natural disasters and things that are you normally going to be experiencing in life first. Okay. So that is power failure, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes. If you live in these areas, earthquakes in these areas, having food, water, medical and security 
having a way to defend your property and your loved ones because during these major events and these major natural disasters, odds are law enforcement cannot get to you. I mean, we've seen National Guard go in during Katrina and other events, but they can't cover the whole disaster area, right? So you need to be able to protect yourself. Um, but we also teach, and I do believe we are going to be seeing some major events right now. <clears throat> We've already seen the price of fuel for one. We've seen the price of food going through the roof, and that's going to continue to go through the roof. The American dollar, in my belief, and from what I'm watching, is going to collapse. And when that does, I'm afraid that we're going to be right back. We're going to be just like what happened with Venezuela when their economy crashed. Everything, their money was not worth anything. I mean, you could you could take silver down there and you could actually purchase more food than a whole bunch of their dollars because it was worthless. So we try to prepare for as much as possible. I tell people to start with a three-month supply. That will cover you and your family for a very long time during a natural disaster. But if you're serious about what could come and if a global conflict was to happen and we are drawn into it, and my belief we will, if, a glo- if another global conflict, a large one happens, yeah, you're going to need a lot more than three months worth of food. You're going to need one to two years, and you're going to also need to know how to grow your own food. You're going to need to know how to process that own food, dehydration. Uh, if you have one of those freeze dryers, those things are nice, but those things are very expensive. All that stuff you can store up. You're going to need supplies. You really are. And the main thing, though, is water purification. Always just, even if it's just a Sawyer mini water filter, it's like 20 bucks. That will filter out all forms of bacteria in the water. I use those things for with my outdoor survival trips and everything else I've been using for years. I've never had any issue. Uh, a water filter is your main thing. Three days without water, that's, that's a very good, very good rule to follow. But it depends on where your location is. Like if you're down here in Florida after a hurricane, it's usually summertime. Trying to last three days with no power and no water, it gets very hot here. You'll be lucky to make it three days in this heat with no water. So having a way of purifying water, having a way of collecting water, even an idea of just taking a, an inflatable kiddie pool and you run a gutter off your off your roof so it actually collects water and then you purify that water. Very simple, very easy to do. If you don't want to do the immaculate rain barrel collection, you don't have the room to store up gallons and gallons of water because the fact is, Storm water takes up a lot of room. It really does and weighs a lot more than anything else. Oh, so it's better to just filter it on site out of your home instead of storing any of it. No, well, you still need to store some because it could be a while, it could be a while before it rains or you might be running into contaminants. But I would say, you know, I would say store about 30 days worth of water is what I'd say. Okay, and you can find them in different places. You can buy those real expensive bricks or you can get a gallon, buy the gallon, stuff like that. But see, for the long haul, you're going to be finding locations that has water and tra- transporting that and filtering that out. But I would recommend having at least 30 days worth of water on hand. Okay, well, that makes sense. In terms of uh, producing your own food, again, it, it, I just have to think, in, again, in terms of uh, someone that, you know, doesn't want to prep or hasn't really thought about prepping or is resistant to it. You know, what, what is the easiest thing you can do, let's say in terms of growing your own food, you know, maybe you can't supplement a hundred percent of it, but what, what parts are easy to grow and easy to do to supplement part of your food? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we do grow food here. We, we run gardens and things like that. Uh, there's something that most people don't really think about when, when you run the garden, it takes a lot of land to actually be a hundred percent on that garden. It depends on how large your family is because the amount of time it takes to produce food is anywhere from three months to five months, you know, to actually grow something. And from my experience, like down here in Florida and also North Carolina, and when I lived in Arizona, uh, the weather can destroy your crops. So you need to have food on hand, can dry goods, things like that. You need to have preps for growing season because if something happens to that garden, you're relying on, you need to have preps to make multiple grow seasons in case there is a, uh, contamination from pollution or weather change or something like that that destroys your, your crops. If you were relying on that, you know, you're pretty much, <laughs> you're pretty much messed up then. So you're going to have to rely on something else. Uh, the easiest ones, it just depends on your location. All right. So down here in Florida, the easiest crops that we were able to grow is lettuce, radish, corn, zucchini, cucumbers. Uh, I'm still having trouble with carrots for some reason. I've been, I've been trying for three years. And I'm still having trouble with my carrots. Um, broccoli, okra, 
these are very simple, very easy to do. And, you know, our climate down here, very humid, very hot. We have to start very early, but we also deal with massive storms that roll in. If you have the property to have nice greenhouses, hey, that's great. The greenhouses are expensive to construct. You can make the cheap ones. You can find them online with the plastic sheeting and stuff like that. But down here in Florida, the UV lighting would just go, would, it would destroy that plastic, makes it really dry rot, and it doesn't last more than one season. So, so really, what's a better covering than plastic? Then it's it's that plex, uh, that kind of like a plexiglass. It, it lasts much longer for the greenhouses. But I've seen the cheaper ones built with the plastic sheeting, like you get in a roll. And the sun down here, if it's out in the open, it, it just burns it up. It becomes brittle. Um, I've made tarps and stuff out of that stuff, and it might last four to six months down here. Hmm, okay. Do you think for most people it's more practical just for them to supplement their existing food? You know, let's say they're like, and it sounds like a lot of work growing all my own food and storing it and dehydrating it and blah, blah, blah. You know, if someone is lazy, but they want to do something, what's like, you know, how do they dip their toe in and, and let's say get started? What's like the minimum they can do to, to get a feel for it, to see if they like it or not, you know, regardless of whether it's practical. But what can people do that's a baby step to get started? Yeah. So I would definitely start with just trying to supplement your own food. And the fact is, it's actually a, pretty much a full-time job doing that too. Uh, supplements about the easiest way you can actually go about it, just to add like a fresh salad here and there. But it is, it is a job. It really is. Um, trying to garden your own food is not something that you just – plant in the ground and walk away and hope, you know, just water because you're fighting pests, you're fighting weather, you're always out there killing the ground, you're always out there weeding. Uh, we're talking hours a day. It's not something that you just put in the ground and be done with it. I've seen people grow inside their home with the aid of grow lights and things like that. Grow lights are expensive. You have more, you have more control, your crops as far as weeds and pests and things like that, you know, growing inside your home. But the amount of room it takes, it takes up a lot of room. If you have a dedicated room to grow a garden, you know, a grow light garden, that's great, but you're going to be using a lot of power with those grow lights. You're going to be using a lot of water, of course. If, if everything shuts down, you're going to need water. So do you have a way of collecting water? Uh, with society all intact, all utilities, yes, gardening is good. I've seen the window sill gardens and things like that. The fact is, those things do not produce enough to really supplement anything. You got a small. Yeah, how, how much is needed? Like, is there what's the calculation of how much is needed in terms of gross space per person? Let's see. I think is one hectare for one person is a good supplement, and a hectare is their size of of uh, growing area, and that's for a year, if I remember correctly. I could be wrong on the exact size. So our garden is thirty feet by twenty feet. And that's only going to produce supplement here and there. It's, it's nothing we could ever live off of entirely. There's just no way. And that's that's a pretty good sized garden. That's about three. Yeah, miles. I'm surprised. Wow. We have multiple rows, but we've got five mouths in our local area. And I try not to give too much information out on everything we do here as far as people and stuff like that. So we're going to go with five. Let's say you got five people you're trying to take care of. And that's not enough, not for three meals a day. It's not because it takes anywhere from four, you know, three to six months, five months to grow something. And then when it does grow, let's say that you have everything perfect and everything comes out right. One plant, let's say a squash, produces three to five squashes. Okay, you got five people. If you don't have any other food coming in, everything's coming out of that garden, your natural vegetables and stuff like that, your body process really quick goes right through you very fast. But just having squash all the time, one, you're going to get burnt out in it. Two, that's not enough nutrition, just eat nothing but squash. So a squash plant can take anywhere from three feet to seven feet when it expands out. So that takes, I mean, even the size of these plants will take up a lot of room. So that's why, I mean, you know, 35 by 20 foot garden gets really cramped really quick. And then when you plant your rows and put your plants in your rows, you got to space all this stuff out whatever the plant needs so it doesn't feel congested it's got enough room to get its nutrition so even that is spaced out it looks like a large plot of land but when you get everything spaced out correctly you got about two to three foot between your rows you just lost a lot of real estate there just trying to grow one row yeah and then all the different plants need to be cared for differently 
they all have different grow times. You know, you said there's pests, there's bad weather, there's there's a lot to it, I guess. Hmm. It makes it kind of scary. You know, it, it, I guess that's why you need to stock up on, on foods that can be stored for a long time because producing them yourself is not easy. Yeah, producing them yourself is not easy. I do encourage people to actually start doing it because once you learn how your area is and that you already know what you're going to be facing that following year, unless something major event happened. Um, but it is, I mean, you're, you're spending hours, hours a day out there. Now in today's society, when we're all trying to work and everything else, we've got all this stuff going on. It's, it's kind of hard to dedicate every single day to your garden. I mean, when I was working full time an actual job before I started doing my business on YouTube, I was having to work in the garden during the evenings when I got home by flashlight because I did not have time to weed or anything else like that. It was burning me out. It took hours to get the sucker going correctly and then to maintain it. But you need to have food on hand in between this. But now when a major event happens where, let's say, everything's shut down and you are at home, you got plenty of time to work on that garden, most people think. What about water collection? What about running security, trying to keep your property? If you're the only person with food, and you got a big old garden there, you will have people looking. And now you're being pulled multiple ways. You got to be in the garden, work in the garden for your food, but you also got to keep an eye on people that might be trying to do something evil against you. You know, somebody wants to take your stuff. You've got to be collecting water. You have to be cooking. You have all the stuff that you got to be doing. So this is one of the reasons I always talk about working with a community of people building a prepper community your neighbor stuff speak to them about events and things you don't have to go in all tinfoil hat up down here in florida it's easy i talk to people about hurricane preparedness hey you guys got y'all ready for this season yeah we got this we got that hey if something major happens what you, what's your plans and that's how i get my, my icebreaker in and then we start talking about it and the next thing you know they're coming into my group and it's not militia or anything like that we're a, we're a community of people we all have our own lives we work together on we can sustain ourselves in case something major happens and it can be done now i know there's some people that have some neighbors that you know they just don't like things like that and i get that and it's not for everybody but i do encourage people to reach out to other people especially in a major event yeah no that's really cool that you're doing that have you found any optimal size group like, what's too many and what's too few people to do that with? I don't believe there's there's such thing as too many or too little. If you even have one other person that's going to be there to render aid and help you with what you're trying to do and you're working together, that's a group. Even if it's just one other person that you've got, that's an extra person there to take some of the workload off. You got somebody running security while you're while you're taking care of the you know chores stuff like that. You've got somebody that can watch your back while you guys sleep. Because if something major and really bad happens, you're going to have to sleep some point in time. A group too large, watch it. What you got to watch how you speak about things because government watches large groups. They're they're called militia groups and things. The government keeps an eye on these people. You don't want to be one of those gun toting slinging. You know we're going to take over this and we're going to take over that. You don't want to do that because then you have somebody beating on your door and stuff like that. So don't do that. Just. Just worry about your family, you know, worry about surviving natural disasters and stuff like that. There is a time and place for other things, but right now I just tell people just be ready for natural disasters and taking care of your family. Yeah, that's practical. Do you think that it's more likely that there will be natural disasters that cause us to have to go into our, you know, cause us to prep or is it going to be self-created disasters by, um, you know, our dear leaders? Which one do you think is more likely? Uh I would say more likely natural disasters because I've experienced more natural disasters than anything else. But I also look at what is coming as far as what else is going on in the world. Look at society, look at the breakdown of both morality, laws, government institutes and what they're doing and seeing how it's affecting us as civilian citizens of a country. Um, I still say you need to be you need to be stocking up for the long haul because the way things are going with this country and what's going on overseas. Like I said, if something major happened, like a world conflict, that's going to be affecting us here as well. It's going to affect everything. Just look at the shortages that we're dealing with, with fuel, natural gases and food, food prices. Look at everything that happened with just uh, the barges and stuff. All this, you know, all the, all the ships were at port. Prices of everything, availability was hard. Microchips, all these things were hard to get hold of. A major conflict happened. You better be expecting none of that stuff to work. Um, 
if the fuel keeps on going up high, what food that is delivered is going to be extremely high because they got to pay for all that diesel and all that equipment, not just the, not just the truckers. You got the farmers, all that equipment that they're having to run, every single bit of that. All that stuff's going to go through the roof. Uh, we import a lot of food from other countries. I believe it's 70% of our fruits and vegetables come from foreign countries. That's a lot. I could be a little bit off on that, but I think the last article I read was 70% of our fruits and vegetables come from other countries. Now, most of them are from South America. So, you know, Central America, South America, and Canada. But we do get stuff in from China. We get stuff in from other countries. So that does play an effect. I mean, look at Walmart. A lot of food, a lot of products that come in there at Walmart is China. Yeah, Walmart essentially is China. <laughs> yeah, a lot, now, of people, uh, now I'm in a lot of people give me a lot of stuff about shopping at Walmart. But the fact is our government sold out the country many, many years ago. And whatever I have to do, if I'm able to save a lot of money and put t- more towards prep, I buy at Walmart because I can buy more food and more supplies for my family compared to less by going to Trader Joe's or whatever, Whole Foods. Yeah. So do you think um, people should just slowly save, like how fast should they accumulate this um, this three month supply of what they need, you know, water and food? Should they go crazy and do it as fast as they can? Or should they just, every time they go shopping, get a little bit extra, a little bit extra and build it up slowly? Okay, so I've always said a little bit slowly. All right, I've always said that. With what I'm seeing overseas, and we all know with that. I try not to say too much because it's regulated on the internet. Um, with what we're seeing with those countries overseas with this with this conflict, I believe this is going to be rolling in faster on us. I've always told people five dollars extra a week, twenty dollars extra a week, whatever. I really would recommend people to start ramping up their supplies as much as possible. Don't go get a loan or anything like that. Don't max out your credit cards to do this stuff. Do it responsibly, but start making cuts in your daily life. All right. If you go to Starbucks for coffee, start brewing your own coffee at the house. You'll save a lot of money right there. Uh, thing with prepping, most of us preppers, we sacrifice a lot of things. Like uh, we don't we don't go on vacation out of town and stuff. My wife and I we went on vacation a couple weeks ago. We went like 30 miles from the house. We went to our local beach. We rented you know we we rented a motel and stuff. But we we saved up for like six months. We don't do much of anything. We stay at home. We don't go to the movie theaters. We don't go through drive through none of that stuff. We cook at home. Everything we do, we try to cut back on excess so we can actually prepare more for what's coming. So, sorry, that, that kind of got a little way out there. But I do encourage people to ramp up their preps right now. I do. I, okay. For years, I've been saying $5 a week. But with what's going on with the fuel, the economy, and the economy, I don't care what they say, it is not getting better. I keep on seeing the reports of how many jobs, and it's not getting better. The economy's in the tanker right now here in America, and it's going to continue to get worse. I say start getting your stuff prepared. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, very good. Um, so for people that are interested and want to take these first steps, where can they go to engage with you? Like, what's the name of your YouTube channel, and what are some resources you have for them? Uh, my YouTube channel is Survival Living, right there on YouTube. Uh, we cover everything from food preparation stock and we do weekly prep series where i go to the store show you what i'm buying kind of give you ideas of what you can also get what you can make with things uh we go over how to store correctly mylar vacuum seal all that stuff outdoor survival skills in case there is an emergency you have to actually live off the land things like that we cover that as well that's part of what i do with the business is teaching outdoor survival so if you get stuck you get lost whatever you have the availability to survive while you're trying to get help or walking back home, one of those two. Uh, I do have a Facebook, uh, Twitter, all that stuff. Um, but all those links are on my YouTube channel. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Joseph, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. You got a ton of knowledge. And I, I really appreciate you going through all this for everybody. And those that listen, even if they take some action, I think it'll help them a lot. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah. Even even just the slightest thing, one extra meal, you just bought yourself one extra meal time. So mm. yeah, even a little bit helps to stay at it. If it's only $5 a week, you're still above the game for when everything stops. Excellent. Before you stop listening, ask yourself, what are one or two useful things you heard on this podcast that can help you overcome food and fertilizer shortages, skyrocketing prices, the cost of living, or your job being outsourced overseas or eliminated due to automation? 
Please like and subscribe and tell your friends and family about their Surviving Hard Times podcast. We're all going to need help now and in the near future.